technology is that uh, it was developed through the eyes of a businessman, keep it simple, under the KISS method, keep it simple. And if I could apply the law of economics, then in fact I could bring it in by um, <clears throat> the approach of uh, decentralization, both in, in mass production as well as uh, installation. So that not everyone knew what they were making, they were just making a little part of it. Well, <clears throat> no, not, that was not the question. For example, uh, uh, if I was to build up uh, a large manufacturing facilities and put in uh, 5 or $15 uh, billion dollars over a 15, 20-year period of time, then the banking institutions, the World Bank System controls me. But there are many uh, people, uh, independent business people, that own their own plastic mold injection outfits. They can, they own their own uh, electronic uh, areas. So the question is, as a businessman, why should I <coughs> try to invest in equipment and hardware and buildings and so forth that's already there? You have the opportunity to those people who have existing business or want to go into independent businesses, okay, and say, hey, here's a product. This is what we want you to make. You go ahead and do it. But you centralize. Uh, both the production uh, of the uh, devices as well as the decentralized installation because we're, we're facing a very high critical situation uh, today. As an example, uh, if you look at my logo, it says uh, Job 38 verse uh, 22 and 23. And Job 38 verse 22 and 23. Alright, now I started the development of the water fuel cell technology back during the time when the air was through the embargo on the United States. And at that time, we were caught by uh, surprise. And uh, as an example, we had only uh, two and a half days of aviation fuel to fight a war. In all probability, at that time, if Russia would have known it, they would probably would have attacked the United States. Our entire uh, uh, sophisticated uh, naval task force sat out in the ocean for several weeks before the first supply ship uh, came alongside. Uh, I was affiliated in retailing the truck parts, making over a million dollars a year profit, actually 20 million. Uh, throughout the United States and when our trucks stopped along the side of the roads and goods and services were no longer moving then I started asking such questions as hey how long do we have before the food supply chain in the United States is di disrupted and many businesses like Cardinal Food Industry in uh, Columbus Ohio said hey Stan we have less than 27 days if you don't get those trucks moving then the masses of people in the Columbus Ohio will be facing starvation because the entire industrial base of the U.S. as well as international is based on the supply and utilization of energy. And it alarmed me that a little country over the Mideast could actually cripple the United States, not only cripple the United States, but actually cripple the war of the entire world based on uh, the supply of energy to maintain those industrial bases. So at that time, I went into my office laboratory and said, God, I love my country. It's the greatest country. Uh, uh, if you'll help me put a power supply in the country, I'll do anything that you want me to do. So I have been actually bringing in the technology under the power and authority of the Word of God. And of course, uh, many people ask me why I'm still alive today. Well, I've learned the power of angels. Uh, in the Bible, one guardian angel destroyed 185,000 Assyrian troops. And in the Bible, one guardian angel destroyed all the firstborn of Israel. And I have two of them with me at all times. One happens to be a foot bigger than I am. He's got a chest on like that. And I said, thank you, Lord, I need him. <laughs> so when I started... Um, uh, my background is quite diversified from research development, product development, engineering, corporate entrepreneurial, starting a corporation from ground floor right on it, up in the multi-international areas. And so I really have found out the Lord had prepared me well over 20 years or more to do what I'm doing today. So back in 1975 as an independent businessman, uh, I was relatively uh, not attached to any major research uh, development facility. So I started to develop uh, the technology in my own laboratories. And as a result, it was pretty hard to extrapolate what I was doing. Uh, one of the strategies was, of course, was I had filed a series of patents. I did not file a total master patent. You know, there's many loopholes in both in the uh, U.S. patent uh, processing and international uh, areas. As an example, if you would release some of this technology into the public domain, uh, England will statutorily block you from receiving your patents all in Europe. Yeah, well, that's what we've heard too. Is that, that, that if you're trying to put any patents in or anything, it's the quickest road to the CIA or whoever is trying to stop this kind of work. So that's why I'm amazed that you've actually. Well, what happened in the United States was that uh, in the late 70s, uh, Congress had passed the law. Had passed the law that uh, the U.S. government must now recognize the inventor because it's in our Constitution that we have the rights for the, uh, to invent the technology. So I doubt very seriously if this technology would have been able to be developed in any other country in the world because of the Constitution. 
And uh, yes, I had fought many, many battles. Uh, the Arabs had tried to uh, squelch and suppress the technology, so as the Russians and uh, even uh, Japanese elements had come into the technology. But um, uh, the strategy was, as the Lord had shown me through the Holy Spirit, was that uh, as I started developing the technology, I started filing the patents. I filed a series, a multiple series of patents. And each patent by themselves, were, it was patentable and did solve a given problem in utilizing hydrogen as a fuel source. But they'd only woke up to the second the second last patent as to really what I had. And at that time, it was too late. Uh, yes, I had fought many battles. And of course, I'm writing a book about all of it. And the title of the book is With the Lord There's Purpose. And, and it will give my testimony of all the battles and so forth we have fought. But when I was pulled into the Pentagon, when the U.S. government recognized what I had, and I was escorted into the Pentagon because uh, wars had been won or lost by the supply of uh, fuel. And of course, Patton proved that in... Uh, in World War II, and uh, we, in our national and military budget, about 50% of that's for logistic support of energy. Well, also during the Arab embargo, as an example, when we had no diesel fuel to uh, operate our diesel-fired uh, submarines, uh, the nuclear task force had to go on alert 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In a very short period of time, over 60% of our nuclear task force had become inoperable. And as a result of that, the U.S. for the first time had no abilities even for global defense. Uh, shortly now, now from 1975, during the Arab embargo, we were dependent on about 40% of foreign oil. And this is where the President of the United States said that we must come up with an alternate energy source if we are to survive. We have not reversed our dependency on foreign oil. It's now escalated to well over 60%, where I forced uh, DOE, Department of Energy, to admit to the American people that, in fact, uh, we are still dependent of around 60% on foreign oil. Now, if anything happens or takes place where that oil is stopped to the countries, then the entire economic base of this country or any other world would collapse. Uh, I have been preaching, in fact, that the same thing that occurred in the U.S. fields from, that occurred from 1965 to 75, where our oil pressure started dropping in, in the oil fields, we went on the dependency of foreign oil. Now, the exact same thing that has occurred in the United States is also uh, has been occurring in the Arab fields. You just can't keep pulling the oil out of the ground and expect that it's going to be there forever. And I have five governmental agencies, U.S. governmental agencies, that's verified now that in fact that the, that their oil fields are starting to depressurize, but they are depressurizing fifth, or three times faster than occurred in the United States. So the experts know that in fact that we have less than 15 years of supply of oil coming out of the Middle East. Now, after 15 years, if there's not a new and an alternate energy source that comes into the world economy, then the entire world economy will be destroyed very quickly. And are you saying the governments are admitting this and saying, go ahead? Yes. In other words, the issuance of our patents was on the premise that we would bring the technology out and get it into the marketplace. Uh, another situation has come up, of course, I have been trying to develop the technology to possibly head off the Mideast crisis. Uh, what they really don't under, uh, what they're not really uh, realizing at the present time in the Middle East, if uh, Sudan decides to use CBR weaponry, that's chemical biological radiation weaponry, uh, from what I understand, uh, the Germany had sold them the germ warfare. If he uses this type of weapon in the Middle East, then it's possible uh, that the germ warfare that they have is that that the contamination, the germs, can breed on the bacteria in the air or bacteria in water or even in bacteria of oil. It takes a very small amount of deposit of the germ warfare in order to allow it to expand and grow. So if he uses this in the Middle East at this, at this critical time, then what's going to happen is that it's possible that, the, that all the oil reserves in the Middle East will become contaminated. If that's the case, then every country of the world or respective country of the world will have to stop shipment of oil to their countries uh, to prevent the contamination to occur within their own country and possibly affect the lives uh, of the people within each country. So you're looking at that it's possible that within a short short period of time the entire flow of oil coming out of the Mideast will totally be stopped and that will shut down the entire industrial base in the entire world. Are you saying like, like you know, the Rockefellers and whatever have so far, like um, we were saying before, come in and said stop the development of this technology, are you saying that they won't do that anymore? No, no, no. Um, uh, there are several uh, major swings that has now started to alert the, the, the public that we must do something. One is tooth is a very powerful thing. Now they're recognizing, in fact, that uh, the oil reserves are not there for the world, 
and that they are depleting you very, very quickly, and that we must somehow swing to an alternative energy source to uh, allow the economic base to survive. Secondly, uh, we're realizing that we cannot keep continually polluting the air. We can't keep putting harbor carbons in the air. We can't keep extracting oxygen out of the air. We must be able to reverse the greenhouse effect. And, and if we do not do this, then uh, it's uh, uh, very reasonable to say that within a short period of time, we'll start to suffocate. In the inter-period of time since the introduction of the automobile, as an example, uh, the content in the air, I believe, was around 38 uh, percent. Uh, or 28 percent. That has really, uh, from that point on until now, it has dropped uh, as much as 7 percent. Now, right now, there's 5.2 billion people on the face of this earth, and within a mere 15-year period of time, it'll double to 9 billion. We already know by satellite that the uh, rain forces are dying, that over 50 percent are dying. That's irreversible. They are dead. That's supplied about 80 percent of the oxygen uh, in our air. So we can't. Yes. I think he also asked about Rockefeller. They have tried every way to, to stop him too. Yeah. Yes. He asked about Rockefeller. Yes. yes. Uh, in my, uh, it became very evident that this type of technology cannot be developed through the uh, uh, the federal governments nor the multinational corporations because of the control mechanism. It had to be developed <laughs> by an individual working out of this garage without that type of control mechanism. So. Uh, it was a way that when I started, the Lord had started to have me develop the technology and develop in such a way that uh, uh, I was able to get all the patents issued both nationally and not only win it for the United States, but also win it for the world. Uh, because once they realized what I had, and, uh, and as I said, they had pulled me into the Pentagon, there was two major reasons that I had used to get us off the national security and allow it to come in. Number one, if you don't have an economy, you will not have a government, and if you don't have a government, you're not going to have a military. It's just as imperative that this technology get into the marketplace as well as these other areas. Second one is, what happens, gentlemen, if a foreign power can come in your land and use your own existing laws to block this type of technology from coming in? That's when uh, President Reagan took the executive action to assure and guarantee uh, the issuance and the processing of these patents. So it's a, it's a struggle. We're all in the same boat, so to speak, and therefore we have to be able to solve the problem. We know that the federal government and the multi-internationals cannot control it. If I had signed this technology over to General Electric or Westinghouse or any other multi-international corporation, they would be taken over within a period of 24 hours. If you have enough money, you can take over anything you so desire. Now, 60%, we're paying out well over $200 billion to the Arabs uh, for that petrol fuel. They spent $200 billion from trying to keep this thing off the marketplace. That's why communication is one of the most uh, greatest things that we have today. That's why I'm here in, in communicating uh, uh, as to what we're doing. I heard that the stealth bomber was uh, maybe <coughs> flies using the same sort of technology. Yes, and uh, also we developed the hydrogen-powered aircraft that was originally to go Mach 25 in outer space, and with this technology, it take it right on up to 150 Mach. The United States is not sitting on this technology, but no stretch of the imagination. <coughs> right now, as the uh, we are down to uh, a day and a quarter of aviation fuel to fight a war, and once we bridge uh, and reduce the fuel supplies, go down to a day, then the Joint Chiefs of Staff will have to make the decision: no more global defense. And as we all know, that when when countries go from a dictatorship to free democracy, the war brokers are in there, and the pendulum can swing into civil war or disrupt it into tremendous war. And of course, they make their monies by war. That's what they do. They promote wars. And uh, the war brokers started World War One. They'd start uh, World War Two, and they'd start World War Three in the name of making money. Whether we live or survive, uh, they'd be happy making the money. So uh, this the situation is very real now. Uh, it's primarily over the Middle East that could that could topple and uh, cripple the entire industrial base, of the entire world. So this was the basis of the reasons for developing the water fuel cell technology. And as I had developed it, uh, there were several major design criteria that I had to comply with. The first one was that I had to build the system in a garage. And the reason for that was is because uh, uh, if I could build it in a garage, I would bypass exotic manufacturing technology that can toy it. For example, if a guy had developed a chemical that could make the solar cell uh, more efficient, but if Exxon controlled the wafer, which is in turn controlled by the Arabs, it can't get out in the marketplace. So the technology had to be built uh, by the KISS method, keep it simple, stupid, don't make it complicated. And secondly, it had to be built out of uh, very readily available materials. 
because we don't have time to develop exotic materials or like used platinums and so forth that we have not access on them, like Russia controls the bulk of platinum in the world. Uh, another criteria was that it had to be built uh, through the laws of economics, that the guy who comes up with the simple way is going to win out. Now there's a lot of Cadillac ideas that come into existence, but they're because it violates the law of economics, it never gets out to the marketplace. So we had to develop through the eyes of a businessman, and the guy who comes up with the cheapest way is going to win out. Now my files back home in my laboratory, I have the uh, most populated study on hydrogen that's ever come out of the scientific world through NASA. As you probably know, the Columbia Spaceship Program is propelled by liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. And in that report, it clearly stipulated that hydrogen was the most ideal fuel of the future that could be utilized anywhere in the world. But they had not the answer in the following areas. Number one, to produce the hydrogen gas economically. Second area was to be able to control the hydrogen on demand. Third area was to be able to adjust the burn rate of the hydrogen gas to co-equal the fossil fuels. And I added a fourth one, the ability to transport it without uh, spark ignition. And I hold all the patent rights both nationally and internationally on this technology. Now since the technology was built uh, under the power of authority word of God in a garage, it now gave me the abilities to be able to release it under the law of economics. So uh, no, when as a product development engineer, uh, uh, whenever anyone would show me a new idea, a new concept, a new way of doing something, if it would do, not comply with the law of economics, you gentlemen would not hurt my feelings, you can get out and walk out of the meeting anytime you want, uh, I would do the same thing. Uh, if the technology was complying to the law of economics, and then when you look at this tech base, if you answer the question that yes it does, then you'd have to agree that we have a new alternate energy source that we can move into the economies of the world and do it very, very, very quickly. So we started to proceed on developing, and as the Lord had shown me the knowledge uh, pertaining to water, uh, right now we're facing a tremendous problem beyond the Mideast situation. I was in Washington, D.C. in 1965 when the government called the uh, scientists together to come up with a fail-safe nuclear power system. In three days, and listening to their testimony, I got up in a meeting, and uh, this is before I had come to the Lord, and I uh, said, gentlemen, everything you said is a bunch of BS. Subject, uh, there is no substance on the face of this earth that you subjected to the hostile environment and nuclear radiation, you're going to have the hourglass effect. And then, of course, Three Mile Island uh, proved that prophecy out many years later. And, of course, uh, Chernobyl, we all know about Chernobyl. Now, they talk about uh, the radiation going up in the atmosphere, but they don't talk about the meltdown going down into the water table. Mm -hmm. And the water table now is dumping the contaminated or radioactive uh, water into the Mediterranean which is now, in a very short period of year, the Mediterranean will increase in radiation, will spill over into the Mediterranean. So all those millions of people in Europe now that will use the water to wash their clothes or to drink or process that water will probably die of uh, cancer uh, due to the high exposed radiation. So now, during, uh, for example, uh, uh, England almost had a near, uh, near, uh, near nuclear accident. Uh, some brilliant engineer decided the way to re, uh, reconstitute the carbon rods, send a bunch of uh, amps in the, into the carbon rods, and all it does is create a hot spot and splits the, splits the rod, which in turn uh, you now have no control. Helsinki just shut down another nuclear power plant uh, with the problems with the circulation on their stainless steel uh, piping. So we're really facing a very critical situation all the way around. Now the uh, in getting in this type of technology or equivalent technology is going to take the masses or the people to come together in one accord. It's no longer going to say, well, I'm going to leave it up to someone else to do it. If we don't do it, it's not going to get in. So in starting developing the technology, the first uh, area was to address how to release the hydrogen from natural water and do it economically and satisfy the first major requirement of NASA. And of course, what the first uh, thing we did in the scientific area is that you always got to learn to ask the right question. Now, uh, in a prior art, uh, example one, we demonstrated this technology under 101, USC uh, uh, section 101, the U.S. Patent Office says that whenever you present something, uh, you must show on an operability, otherwise you do not get the issuance of the patents. When we had showed them the technology pertaining to water, the first thing that they, when they recognize this, is why has no one else thought about this technology before? Well, there were several reasons I gave them. Number one, if you had looked at the scripture, Job 38, verse 22 and 23, the Lord said that the knowledge would come at a time of great trouble. And if this is not a time of great trouble, I don't know what is. 
The second one is that the reason why Faraday did not discover the electrical polarization process is because he needed several modern day inventions and he needed some prior knowledge. One of the things he needed was stainless steel, the invention of stainless steel 304 material, which is chemically entered to the process. If you expose it to hydrogen and oxygen gases uh, in a water bath exposed to voltage, it does not have a chemical in a reaction. That's why you said platinum before, because platinum's in it to the same process. Well, platinum is extremely ultra expensive. Yeah. And it will break down under the, un, under the conditions of exposing to hydrogen and oxygen, some of it. Okay, so stainless steel became a very economical material to use. Uh, matter of fact, on our actual lab certification testing, the longevity of the stainless steel material is 0 .0001 per year. So the fuel cell uh, is just as good as the time you fired up to 20 years going up to 10,000 years. And if any of you guys live over 10,000 years, you come back and tell me, I want to tell you learn your secret. So the stainless steel material gave us the abilities that we now have a component we do not need to replace. We set up a non-chemical environment in order to release the hydrogen from the water. Okay, so we now have, uh, we don't have to replace the parts. If you ever look at the prior arts and electrolysis uh, processes, you will see that their, their electrodes are tremendous mass and size. If a brilliant engineer could get a car to run down the road on electrolysis, he may get it to last for maybe a minute to five minutes or so, but all of that mass size of electrodes will decompose. So inherently, the electrolysis process did not comply to the law of economics because it was a self-destructive unit and it had to add chemicals to it. Now, if you had an electrolysis process and had to add chemicals to it, and let's say you did get a car to run down the road, then you would have to spend billions of dollars to try to come up with chemical refinery plants to be able to try to even support the gas supply um, uh, levels in the United States and that would cost billions of dollars over 20 to 30 to 40 year period of time and EPA would not allow you to dump the chemicals onto the ground. So electrolysis process does not comply to the law of economics and does not be able to solve the problem. It's a self-destructive unit. So we had to come up with a non-chemical device, come up with a way that we could release the hydrogen from water and if we can do this, water has a phenomenal amount of energy source in the form of hydrogen and if you burn it, its energy release is two and a half times more powerful than that of gasoline. So the first answer we needed to find was how do we economically split the water molecule. Now the key was how do we switch off the covalent bonding of the water molecule and so we address what takes place. Well when the two hydrogen atoms... Stan, could, could I check one sec? Yes. Could you sometimes when using a technical term just describe it more fundamentally for those who haven't got the technical basis, like covalent bonds? Yeah, I'm well. Yeah, I'll get to that. Um, First uh, was to address how do we switch off the covalent bonding of the water molecule and do it economically. And uh, when you consider the formation of the water molecule, then when the two hydrogen atoms link to the oxygen atom to form the water molecule, under the law of physics something's got to happen, right? Now what actually happens is that this outer orbit of the oxygen atom uh, normally has only six electrons in it, but this particular orbit will allow us up to eight electrons to be occupied at one particular time. <clears throat> and as a result of this, this now allows the two hydrogen atoms to link up with the oxygen atom to form the water molecule to go into stable state. Now, on the law of physics, that for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, something's got to happen. Now, what actually happens is that when the two hydrogen atoms link up to the oxygen atom, and the oxygen atom accepts, accepts the hydrogen electron to set up the covalent bonding, then something's got to happen. And what happens is that under normal state, there's eight electrons in the oxygen atom, and then there's eight protons. But when the oxygen atom accepts the two hydrogen electrons, then there's, there's an imbalance that occurs. And what now takes place is we have now 10 electrons, but we still have only eight protons. And as a result of this, the oxygen atom takes on a negative electric charge. Now, since the hydrogen atom is now sharing its its electron to set up the covalent bonding, then the positive charge proton swings the hydrogen atom to the positive charge. Therefore, the atoms of the water molecule takes on electrical charge. Now that was the second major thing that um, Faraday would have to know, is in fact that the, that the bonding, uh, the two unlike atoms of the water molecule is actually being held together by an electrical attraction force 
and that electrical attraction force is equivalent to the two shared electrons. So in other words, once it's all combined together, the total charge is zero. Right. That the water molecule is stabilized to net the electrical charge zero, but its atoms are opposite electrically charged. Now another way to verify this, you can send a microwave, the question is, what happens when you send a microwave energy through water and why does it heat up the water and cause the water molecules to agitate? Well what happens is the microwave is swinging the, the atoms of the water molecules because they have a electrical charge applied to them and that's why microwave energy will heat up the water and superheat it very very quickly. Alright so the key is now that what's holding these atoms together is this electrical bonding force Q and Q prime and it is only equivalent to the two shared electrons because on the law of physics says for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. So we know now that uh, it was very obvious then to say hey if that's the case uh, and these atoms do not take on an electrical attraction then in fact it was obvious that if I've exposed the water molecule to a high external high voltage field then we could pull apart the water molecule and do it economically. And uh, uh, the question is, does these unlike atoms take on an electrical attraction field? And they do not. And the reason why they do not do this is because the oxygen atom, those electrons are paired together, paired together and swing in, op uh, in opposite direction as they pair together. They cancel out their electromagnetic field and as a result there is no electrical attraction force between the two unlike atoms. So all we now have to do is to overcome the electrical attraction force of these two atoms based on Faraday's, and I mean based on um, Coulomb's and Newton's second law of electrical force with an electronic circuit. So what we had done now is set up and put an electric voltage field here and electric voltage field here we do it this way So now we set up an electrical uh, field and expose the water molecule to a high electric voltage field and restrict the amps. Then, if this now is set up as a B plus voltage zone and this sets up as a B minus voltage zone, then under the law of, uh, of opposite charges will do what? Like charges will yeah. repel yeah. Yeah. and unlike, attract. unlike will attract. 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 So therefore if I put a B plus voltage field here, would not now the negative charge oxygen atom be attracted to that voltage yes. field? Now, likewise, at the same time, would not, if I put a B minus voltage field here, would not the positive charge hydrogen and oxygen now be attracted to the, to the negative voltage field? And as a result, now, we're using voltage as a potential energy source and pulling apart. The water molecule starts to elongate. As you start to elongate the water molecule, you're now changing the time share rate of the electron, and as a result of that, you pull apart the water molecule. Now there's, there's another phenomenon that is happening also, is that in the characteristic of water, it is a dielectric liquid. Okay? Now in the electrolysis process, it was required that the two best patents ever issued in the electrolysis process was uh, Ian Ork and Horvath's patents, which clearly stipulated that in an electrolysis process, that uh, if you put it into an electrolysis cell, that uh, first of all you had to use distilled water, which is a uh, dielectric liquid. And because of that, you had to add the chemicals to it. And so, with their systems approach, they had to put in 80% was distilled water, which has cost just as much money to process natural water into distilled water than does to run your cart on the road. And then you'd have to put in between 20% uh, 20, 20 per volume of chemical additives like sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide in order to get hydrogen gas production. And because the electropolarization process of using voltage now to separate the water molecule, we now can use ordinary natural water and have it non-processed. But there's another uh, feature to it is that natural water is a dielectric liquid. And when you expose the water molecules to the high voltage zone, then what happens is that because of the dielectric properties of water, then the dielectric uh, properties of water will now become electrically intensified. And so as it takes on an electrical charge, then the hydrogen uh, charges 
will increase in their positive charge areas, and also the uh, octanet atom increases in, in its negative electrical charge. And so what happens now, that since you are increasing these electrically charges uh, being exposed to the applied voltage field, then the covalent electron switches off in the following way. That as this increases positive electrical charge, would not this negative charge covalent electron be attracted back towards the hydrogen atom? And since the negative charge oxygen atom is increasing in its negative electrically charged, would you not now have a repelling force being applied to the covalent bonding? And so as a result, when you tune in now on voltage, now you have the ability to automatically switch off the covalent bonding of the water molecule. Now that, that now became a physical force in separating the water molecule and voltage now becomes potential energy. Now in the field of physics, we know that voltage does in fact perform work. We've known this for quite some time. But heretofore, never anyone ever dreamed of using potential energy in the form of voltage to perform work in order to pull apart the water molecule. And if and Faraday would also have had the, had the knowledge that in fact he had to have an electronic circuit, which we call the voltage intensifier circuit, that gave us the ability to switch off the amp flow and allow the voltage to take over in a dead short condition. Now in all probability, if he'd have had this knowledge, then we'd have been on hydrogen uh, many, many, many years ago. Now, the point out about potential energy on voltage, um, to give you an example of this, is if you go home and you turn on your TV set or your computer monitor, you're adjusting the B plus voltage potential behind the screen, and as a result, you're now accelerating the negative charge electrons coming off the, off the gun, and that increased velocity of the negative charge electrons striking the fluorescent material now produces a, a greater light intensity. We know also, like in a cyclotron, that if you uh, use opposite electrical fields, you now can accelerate particles in a two or three mile area tunnel, and as a result of this, you can accelerate these particles close to the speed of light, and those particles hit a photographic plate, and that's how physicists study matter. So we knew, in fact, that voltage does, in fact, perform work, but heretofore, no one ever dreamed of applying it to switch off the covalent bonding of the water molecule and do it in this way and do it economically. I was always told in the past that current did the work. Right, always current, and they would always, uh, because he now Faraday, he needed modern day electronic circuit designs capable of restricting amps and allow voltage to go over. He worked with a very crude battery, and he worked with uh, just an electrical wires going into the, the beaker with chemicals. So he created a dead short condition, and when you create the dead short condition, you cannot bring voltage up. Voltage remains low, and, and amps uh, uh, take over and does the work. All right, so. Uh, this is the why Faraday did not discover the electropolarization process. Now, in order to come up with the economic way of doing this, then the Lord had me to develop what was called the VIC, or the voltage, it's called the voltage intensifier circuit. Which gave us abilities now to restrict the amps and allow voltage to take over. Now, uh, as you know, or who's electronic people in here? Oh, praise the Lord. Okay, <laughs> whenever electronic people can understand this far easier than a physicist. A physicist deals with strictly the, uh, the nucleus of the atom, and electronics deal, or the uh, electronics deals with the movement and deflection of electrons, and that's exactly what we're talking about, moving and deflecting electrons. And in the electronic circuit, it's clearly pro proven by Coulomb's and Newton's second law, you can use electrical force to move electrically charged particles in an electronic circuit. Is that not the basic basis of electronics? Yes. Okay, so uh, we're not defining the laws of physics in order to accomplish tasks. Now, whenever you put a dielectric liquid between two electrical conductive plates, what do you got? You got a capacitor, right? So we know that when you take a coil and hook it in series to a capacitor, you now develop what's called a resonant charging choke. So now I've set up two charging chokes on the opposite side of the capacitor. And I'm now allowing the water and the properties of water now to become uh, the property or the component part of the electronic circuit. So we now know that on a resonant charging choke, that when I put in a switching diode in here, then as I would pulse the circuit, as I pulse the circuit, then these coils would become energized and they would create an electromagnetic field which acts as an electronic choke, right? The electrons coming off of here uh, has an electromagnetic field and as a result when these coils develop their magnetic field it now chokes off and prevents electron flow from occurring. 
So since the diode now is acting as a switching diode, once you terminate the pulse, it opens up the pulsing circuit and now allows these magnetic fields to collapse. And when they collapse, now we're producing a unipolar voltage field across the capacitor, but then in the process we are restricting amps. Now note, we are using the electromagnetic field to restrict the amps, not a resistive element. If you have a resistive element, you're consuming power. I know uh, one thing that was noticed in your secret diagram is that you were using a resistive choke. <clears throat> or was that a mistake? Or was that a, in your actual... No, in filing the patents, uh, there's, in filing the patents, I filed them in several ways. They said, well, I use it this way. Mm -hmm. You have a hard time to get around me. Because not only have I filed the patents on the particular technology, but I filed patents in all of its related area to give me a tough uh, technological buffer zone to be able to uh, ensure that I can get bring the technology in. So in other words, that resistive choke that you've got in your... It's not necessary. It's not necessary. And it says, um, where the hell is it? Um, here. <clears throat> you say here, resonant charging circuit, resistive coil wire, R2. Yeah, you, could, you can <clears throat> put a resistive wire with the coil. So some, some intelligent guy is going to say, well, I got a copper, I got a copper coil, and someone says, well, I'm going to use a resistive wire. Well, sorry, folks, I got it both ways. Okay. Oh, I see what you're saying. Just to get around the patent. It's just, just people might use that to get around the, the patent. Yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, a guy invents something, they say, well, all I'll do is I'll change something on the patent and, uh, and uh, try to get around it, okay? Well, this was developed under the KISS method. Keep it simple, stupid. So the simpler it is, the harder it is to get around a patent. And, of course, when... Uh, when this knowledge was coming forth, it was fantastic for us because I knew that if we kept it simple like this, well, then it would be very, very hard to go. And if you look at all of our patents, you put a U-ply voltage across that water molecule, you violated my patent rights. Okay, now what we're doing is that this circuit is not only now restricting the amps, but we're now pulsing and adjusting this uh, pulse frequency to tap into the resonant properties of water by the dielectric value of water and as a result, that when you tune into this, then what happens, amp draw drops down to, to the lowest value, and voltage now takes off towards infinity if the electronic components will allow it to occur. What sort of frequency are we talking about? Well, we have various frequencies when you can adjust, adjust to hit resonance. Uh, the key was to go for natural water, non-processed water. And so uh, it was very obvious that uh, we've developed the electronic circuitry to interface with this that we now electronically zero in to the resonant frequency of any form of natural water because it would change based on the contaminants within the water. It just made a peak itself. Right. Uh, it automatically scans it right in, locks right in the resonance and holds it there. What you can't order change of frequency? Much. Pardon? What order of frequency are we talking about? A few hertz? Or, or no, no, we go up from zero up to 10, uh, 10 kilohertz. Even with this uh, type of a circuit you see here, if I hit this at 10 kilohertz, would this not increase it to 20 kilohertz? So not only is this is a pulsing circuit to restrict amp flow, it's also is a frequency multiplier. And guess what else? If I was going to increase more hydrogen gas yield, what would I do? Increase the voltage. Uh -huh. Increase the voltage in. Yes, now how would I do that? Would I need to change the pulsing circuit here? Oh, just change the amplitude of it. All I have to do here is just increase the number of turns of this coil, would I not? But if you want to do it electronically so that you can control it, um, you could do it just by having a circuit controlling input voltage. And that oh, yes. In, a, in the car, out. in the yes. car, for example, we're bearing it like from 0 to 12 volts. That's right. right. Yeah, with an accelerator. But these can be uh, varied from 0 to 2,000 volts, yeah. 2 kilovolts, right? Or higher. But what I'm pointing out is the electronic circuits are going to remain the same if I want to increase the electrical power still further, the inductance capacitance of this resonant charging choke simply just needs to be increased. So would you step in some more inductance or would you just design a bigger one if you wanted to? Yeah, I just simply design a bigger one and wrap more coils to it. Yeah. So instead of hitting it at 2K, I'm hitting it at 5, 5K or hitting it at uh, 90,000 volts. How many milli of the chokes, approximately? Well, I mean, you can come, uh, it depends. Again, it depends. Uh, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. You're going to have to adjust the power input of the circuit, and the only the only problem with the, uh, to adjust the circuit to get your proper voltage. So you're going to consume electrical power in the circuit. But the point being is, under the power equation, whenever you restrict the amps, the only thing you got left over is voltage, right? Which is potential energy. So you're not consuming it. So I'm going to consume a little bit of energy, uh, two amps or three amps or five amps. Big deal. Because when you release the energy from the water, 
in the form of the hydrogen gas, its energy yield is two and one half times that of gasoline. Now note the rule of thumb, it's not two and a half times that of fingernail polish. It's not two and a half times that of butter. It's actually two and a half times that of gasoline. Okay, now, okay. All right, so now the VIC unit was an experiment in, uh, in developing to restrict the amp flow and allow, allow voltage to take over to release uh, the hydrogen and oxygen gas from water. What sort of frequency is this that you really operate in or, and when you're using, say, just an ordinary tap water or something? What sort of frequency does it normally work? Well, it'll, it'll vary from zero up to uh, 10 kilohertz is what we've been working in the range. If you go up into the megahertz uh, range, then uh, you're getting a more exotic type of electronic components, which is not necessary. You can peak it a little bit further, but it's not, it isn't going to do any good. The, the action uh, is really uh, hitting it with the voltage when you're tuning into the resonance. And when you hit in the resonance under this condition, then the water molecule just falls apart. Okay, so... Uh, That's you what I'm asking. What is the really re the resonance frequency of, of water? Yeah, and based on different... See, natural like, like well water, rain water, uh, city water, ocean water, or, okay, they have different uh, contaminants, anywhere from uh, two parts per million to 20 parts per million, up to 40 parts per million, okay? So resonance can occur any, anywhere in our area. And the other factor that affects resonance is that is the rate by which the uh, gases is going through the resonant cavity. And so that can change. So you can, you'll hit, you can hit resonance at a, at a low uh, voltage level. And as you're raising the voltage level, let's say from 100 volts to 2,000 volts, uh, it's possible that the flow rate of water will start changing resonance. So we've developed the electronic circuits to zero in on that. So it's a very broad range. The beautiful thing I like about it is, it's in the audio range, so uh, yeah. it's just like using audio uh, transformers, you can accomplish the task. Now, if you want to go up and zero it up or fine for a particular application, that's fine, but the key was, was to keep using natural water. If I use natural water or rainwater, is it costing me anything? Mm -hmm. So the three components I'm using in the operation of the fuel cell is stainless steel 304 material, which doesn't you don't need to re, uh, replace, so am I complying with all of economics? Second one is I'm using natural water. Does it cost me anything for natural water? We had a lot of rain around here the other day. Didn't we? How would that apply in seawater stand? Same, th <laughs> same thing. Because you're restricting the amps and allow voltage to take over, the chemical reactor reaction is held at a very minimum. So when you release it, then any contaminants in the water it remains in the water. Now that's the adverse effect of the fuel cell, is that you've got to get a, uh, rid of the contaminants. Well, one of the things is that you can... Uh, operate the fuel cell to meet your energy needs, shut it down, hook a little computer to it, dump out the contaminated water, rinse it out like a dish water, go ahead and fill it up with water again, re-energize it up to around four to six ounces of uh, uh, back pressure and, and continue on operation. But in the cycling, if you notice in my uh, drawings, uh, when uh, you burn hydrogen and oxygen, what's the byproduct? Water. Water, water right? Well, instead of letting the water go back up in the atmosphere... It's pure. Can it's absolutely it, pure. You can right. use it drinking or whatever you want. Right. So can I not recapture the uh, the gas that's coming off yeah. and cool it down and, uh, and as a result feed it back into the fuel cell and recycle it again? So when I do that, then 